Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Hello, everybody. Today's AI ethics seminar will be with Kathleen Strong Hansen and Ulle Hekström. The title is A Conversation About the Book Tenkande Menschor, which means thinking, uh, Tenkande Maschine, which means thinking machines. <laughs> and I will shortly present our speakers. Katrin Strong Hansen is a senior lecturer in language and communication at the Department of Communication and Learning in Science at Chalmers. She has a PhD in English literature from the University of Southern California, and her research ranges from pedagogical explorations of the ways that the study of fiction is beneficial in the teaching of science and technology to literary, literary analysis of young adult, adult literature. And then Ulle Hegstra is a professor of math mathematical statistics at the Department of Mathematical Scientist, Sciences at Chalmers and serves as a chairman of Chair's AI Ethics Committee. He has worked on AI policy issues, both on the national and at the UA, a, a, U, <laughs> European Union level, as well as in the World Economic Forum. Uh, Tenk and the Machine is uh, his first, uh, fifth book. All his previous books are on, the on his research subjects, mathematics, uh, probability and statistics, except for the previous book, which is titled Here Be Dragons, Science, Technology, and the future of humanity. So it is really an exciting moment. And I'm leaving uh, the floor to Catherine and Ule uh, to, to continue this uh, dialogue for us, please. Great, thanks. And I'm excited because I get to ask a bunch of questions. Haha, -ha, the power. Um, but yeah, the, the book that we're talking about is uh, extremely new. I'm guessing so new that people here have likely not been able to see it. So maybe Ole, we could start with just you giving us the, the brief rundown. What is this book about? Uh, particularly for those maybe who haven't had a chance to even have the luxury of, of touching it as I am now. Yeah, yeah. So, so very briefly, the core message of the book. Um, AI has, in my opinion, magnificent promise to make the world better and to help humanity flourish. But this is not going to happen automatically because there are also uh, risks and uh, pitfalls and we need to act with foresight and steer away from, from, from the worst uh, risks out there. And, and uh, the risks are, I divide them in two categories. Uh, one is the uh, down-to-earth issues, dealing with present or near-future artificial intelligence. One example of that is automatic discrimination in software for, for instance, evaluating loan applications. Uh, so that might discriminate against applicants with the wrong ethnic or socioeconomic background or whatever. Another uh, instance of this would be AI software behind social media platforms that are optimized to grab our attention. And they are so um, successful that they cause uh, various kinds of addictive behaviors and so on. So those I regard as down to earth issues and there are several others. Then there are the more high flying issues dealing with an AGI breakthrough. AGI is short for artificial general intelligence. And this is the issue raised by Alan Turing in 1951 on whether following such a breakthrough, humanity will be able to remain in control of the machines. So my book deals with both kinds of these issues. And they're both, in my opinion, serious and important, but it's much easier to get people on board with the importance of the down to earth issues than with the issues surrounding singularities and AGI. Um, so so, so what, what these people suggest is that we shouldn't let those uh, high-flying issues uh, and speculative ideas distract us 
from the very real present day concerns. And I disagree with that. Uh, well, I, I, I agree with part of it. I agree about the importance of issues about fairness versus discrimination, deep fakes and other manipulation on the internet, filter bubbles, labor market effects of AI driven automation, and the autonomous weapons arms race that we are on the verge of. These are important things, but I think it would be a sad anticlimax if we fixed all those issues only to be wiped out by the wrong kind of AGI breakthrough. So we need to think carefully about AGI as well. That's the gist of the book. Yeah, I love that you you have that division between kind of the high flying and the grounded because I, uh, I am at, certainly not uh, an engineer or mathematician. So what I learn of AI comes from a lot of popular news and, and the popular news does tend to focus, uh, it seems to me a bit more on those grounded questions. And I'm not going to dismiss them either, but uh, I appreciated that the book didn't just leave it at that. So for me, that was uh, quite nice. Um, one of the more, I guess, grounded questions that I had it ties into that idea of, okay, AI is coming, it's gonna take your jobs. Sorry, humans. Um, I'm obviously oversimplifying a bit, but if we, if we agree AI will probably have some sort of economic consequences, uh, all technology has some kind of consequences. Isn't it also possible to think of AI as maybe aiding a lot of industries instead of just, okay, all of the jobs go to these AI uh, entities, maybe there'll be supplements here that help yes. humans. So uh, is there a possibility with, with some of these grounded questions that, that we do have um, uh, some of the more optimistic looks? We'll get, we'll get to pessimism in a bit, but, but isn't there some optimism to be found here with some of these grounded questions before we move on to the more high-flying ones? Oh yeah, oh yeah. And, and uh, with uh, AI in, uh, uh, in the workplace, uh, there is this uh, distinction between AI as a supplement to human labor compared to AI as a replacement of human labor. But when you look to the economics of this, uh, the distinction is not so clear uh, because a lot of it can, can, if you make, let's say, a carpenter uh, more efficient by, by giving them uh, better tools, um, this can actually uh, have, have two different effects. Either the, um, the uh, uh, carpenters uh, produce more and the market grows, uh, or uh, the, uh, the effect becomes that, that uh, fewer uh, carpenters can do the same job that more carpenters uh, did before, which uh, may lead to, to, to increased uh, unemployment in case the market doesn't grow. So it's it, a lot of it depends on whether, I mean, in either case, the products will likely become cheaper, but it depends on how the market reacts uh, to those uh, decreases in prices, what happens. Uh, and there's a lot of talk about uh, how AI uh, replaces, uh, can replace uh, routine work and, and we humans can, can move on to focus on, on uh, more stimulating uh, intellectual work. And, and, and it's, I consider it very open uh, how this uh, will play out. Uh, but I assign, let's say, I assign substantial probability to the, the, the possibility that uh, there will be transformative influence on the job market and maybe skyrocketing uh, unemployment figures. Not in the next 10 years, probably not, but in the slightly uh, longer run. Um, but we're talking here as if unemployment was necessarily uh, something bad. And I think there's something to the, be said for the idea that, that uh, machines are here to liberate us from having to work. And you can imagine various utopias where we, where we don't work and instead do what we want. So, I mean, art, culture, 
literature, love, sports, whatever. Uh, but but such a utopia is not going to to just come about all by itself. But we have to plan for it. But as you you point out, there are some questions. Even you mentioned art, literature, those kinds of uh, creative endeavors. There's some uh, interesting work being done on can AIs be creative? I, I listened mm -hmm. to a recording of uh, the, the new Nirvana song uh, based on uh, AI uh, interventions with some uh, Kurt Cobain and Nirvana music. And it, it's not there yet, but but there's some, some uh, work being done with AI creating in those ways, art literature. Uh, do you see those kinds of AI productions on a near horizon? Or it's, it's a little bit hard to guess timelines, yeah. but uh, do you see us getting closer to a time when AIs are creative in the way that we uh, kind of call humans creative? Uh, I think that there are domains uh, where they can uh, compete with us. And some AI generated uh, music is actually, to my primitive ear, uh, ear quite uh, quite nice. Uh, and uh, well, it used to be that, that uh, when uh, questions arised about what domains of the labor market would be protected against automation, it would typically point to two types of jobs, the creative ones and the social ones. And I think that uh, neither of them is, is really uh, safe in the long run. Uh, in principle, I think that there is nothing that humans can do that uh, machines will uh, never uh, be able to do. Um, there could be, uh, I, I used to be a chess player for many decades. I'm, I'm still a chess fan. Uh, and uh, I, spent more, I spent more time than I should watching uh, the world elite players uh, uh, play tournaments uh, uh, over the internet. And since machines are already much, much stronger than humans at playing chess, I would be able to see better uh, chess by watching the machines uh, play against each other. Uh, but I prefer to watch world champion Magnus Carlsen and the other top grandmasters play against the other because I enjoy the human element. And generalizing from this experience, I think that uh, one factor that, that uh, could uh, preserve uh, uh, human labor in, in uh, cultural and other spheres is our desire as consumers of culture to see uh, the human element. I mean, the real human element, not just something that is cleverly designed by AIs to, to look like uh, it was human. I mean, maybe at, at some point the AIs will be able to do that, even that better than us. But the, the knowledge that there is a human sitting there sweating at the chessboard, feeling agony about, about what's going on on the chessboard, I, I think adds a lot to the chess spectator experience. And I think that's generalizable. So that could be one aspect that slows down the uh, uh, replacement of humans in, in creative areas. And the same could go, for, for instance, for novels and uh, visual art and so on and so forth. I guess on that one, we might have to wait and see just at least a little bit longer, or if we're fooled, we don't yet uh, know it now. Um, but um, in in uh, your previous book, uh, the 2016 book, uh, Here Be Dragons, you, you kind of talk about the future of humanity in, in the light of a lot of different advancements. Um, in this book, you don't talk really about nanotech, you don't talk about uh, those other kinds of things. We're, we're pretty firmly here in AI and uh, is there a reason? Do we need to just say those things are, are not mm -hmm. concerns anymore? Or, or is there another reason why you've shifted in this book? Those things are still concerns. Okay. Uh, and and I, I would say especially uh, developments in, in, in biotechnology. Uh, and, and, and for instance, the uh, 
engineering of, of new pandemics is, is, a, is a real concern, stuff like that. So, so yeah. there's a lot, a lot of stuff <laughs> that's important that I don't cover uh, in my book. But I wanted this time to zoom in on the concept of artificial intelligence, because I think intelligence is, uh, is foundational for, 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 for everything that we, that we are now. The, if you compare the world now to the world a million years ago, there's a noticeable dis difference that humans have, have taken control. And that has nothing to do with our muscular power or physical endurance and so on. It's all about our intelligence. And therefore, I believe that it's, it's a very interesting moment of time when we are on the verge of, of creating intelligent machines. Yeah, uh, that verge is a little bit scary, though, um, <laughs> in some ways. One of, one of the things that uh, when I first started reading the book, I think it's in the foreword, you, you say that an AI that surpasses human intelligence kind of takes us over um, that, that verge is likely to be either the best or, or one of the best or one of the worst mm -hmm. things, but, but you don't really... Uh, seem to believe it'll be a middle ground. Is there some reason why you think it's going to go towards an extreme? Yeah, it's 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 because I think that uh, the effects will be tremendous. Mm -hmm. It's a totally different situation when we are no longer uh, the 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 leading agents on the planet in terms of of uh, general intelligence and power to to change things. So, so it's, it's going to be a tremendous change and tremendous changes are typically going to be for the better or for, or for the worse. It would be kind of a miracle if it landed on a kind of status quo in, in, in terms of whatever it is uh, we value. Okay, if, if we're likely to have that kind of tremendous influence, I want to pull up an example uh, that you talk about quite a bit uh, and, and it's two words. Paperclip apocalypse. Mm -hmm. um, so, in in one of your chapters, you you talk. It's not just one of your chapters, but there is one chapter in particular where you talk about this quite a lot. Um, uh, you mention it's uh, Toby Walsh, and he talks about this concept of paperclip Armageddon, where where uh, an AI that is given the instructions create paperclips. Your goal is to create paperclips. Do everything you can to create more paperclips. Uh, so he, he says that this kind of uh, scenario where maybe this is put into place is kind of contradictory because if if there is an AI assumed to be this kind of super intelligent entity let loose with this goal, it's not just going to take over the world, put every atom into paper clips. That's just kind of fundamentally dumb. Uh, I mean, I'm paraphrasing him, but but he's mm -hmm. saying, how could super yes. intelligence be so unintelligent? So, I mean... It, does he have a point here, or is there more to the, that example, the paperclip Armageddon example? Well, there's always more to, to, to everything here. But I think that what Toby Walsh says, says here, and with all re respect for him, I mean, he, he, he's a leading uh, AI researcher. But in this particular statement, I think uh, there's a confusion going on. Uh, he's confusing goals uh, with intelligence. These are uh, orthogonal uh, uh, quantities. Uh, intelligence is, is, is just uh, the ability uh, to change the world in directions uh, that favor your goals, whatever these, uh, these goals are. And there's something, uh, uh, there's something I call the Omohandra Bostrom uh, theory of, of uh, uh, instrumental versus final AI goals, uh, where uh, one of the cornerstones is something called the orthogonality thesis, which states exactly this, that, that any level of intelligence is compatible with pretty much arbitrary goals. You can cook up sort of convoluted counterexamples to this. A very high intelligence, if you combine that with the goal of being stupid, it's not a stable situation. But, but apart from, from, from those very cooked up uh, examples, uh, I think it's right. 
And, and, and when we say that it's stupid to turn the entire world into paper clips, that's something to do uh, that we do from, from the uh, vantage point of our human values. But what do we value? We value stuff like uh, human flourishing, human welfare, biodiversity, stable ecosystems, uh, those, those kinds of things. And, and uh, just as we are regard uh, paperclip production when taken to extremes as, as, as a kind of a stupid goal, you can imagine the paperclip maximizer viewing human flourishing and biodiversity as, as very stupid uh, goals because it doesn't lead to any paperclips, basically. Uh, so you have to try to step out of, of uh, uh, our particular human values in order to think about these uh, different things that, that, that may happen. And, and uh, I th one of the key uh, lessons, I think, from, from, from this uh, paperclip apocalypse example, which I'm kind of uh, fond of, I didn't invent it. It goes back to 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 to, to other thinkers uh, early uh, early this century. But but uh, one of the lessons is that uh, in order for an AGI breakthrough to become dangerous, you don't need to instill the machines with any obviously dangerous goals, such as producing. Um, robots that run around with machine guns. I mean, if, 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 if that was the, the, the goal, everyone would understand that, no, we probably shouldn't do that. But even something innocent looking as, as, as innocent looking as paperclip production can also be, be dangerous. And, and if, we, if we don't think at all about the uh, incentive, uh, incentives and goals, of the first uh, super intelligent AI, but just let it be what it turns out to be. I think that's that's a very problematic attitude because most goals are going to be very different from our human goals. And as soon as we have this discrepancy, it's dangerous. And we humans can't always agree on the same goals either in, in many respects. So that might that's muddy the waters. A yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we've been complicated. Maybe we move on to a simple question. Uh, AI consciousness, super simple, right? There, nothing, nothing easier to settle. Um, you, uh, in the book, you talk about some different thought experiments uh, about uh, uh, AI consciousness, but it, it, it does make me wonder all of these ways of uh, trying to think of an AI that's conscious kind of presuppose that AI consciousness will be uh, some have some similar form to, to human consciousness that, that we can measure them in the same way that we can think about them in the same way. But how will we know if there's an AI consciousness that maybe is radically different from a human consciousness? Is there, uh, are there ways already kind of being formulated to try to understand a consciousness that's just very, very alien to what we experience as consciousness? I told you it was a simple question. <laughs> I mean, this, uh, this is the kind of question that, that uh, still belongs to the realm of, of, of philosophy for the reason that we are as, as soon as we make substantial prog progress on, on a domain, it starts to branch off from, from philosophy. But consciousness uh, is still there. What is consciousness? We, we don't know. And um, to be perfectly uh, honest here, I, well, I am convinced that you are conscious. But on what Thank grounds? <laughs> on what grounds? Uh, uh, am I? I, I? I don't quite see how I uh, can know this. And conversely, I have my uh, cup of coffee here. And, and how do I know that the coffee cup is not conscious? Uh, we don't really know this. And, and while neuroscientists are making progress uh, on, on, on finding um, particular goings on in the brain 
neuro neurological processes that correlate with consciousness. We don't know really why this is or, or, or what the causation is. And, and philosophers also have this concept of uh, philosophical zombies, which are creatures that are just like uh, you and me physically in, in every respect, down to the smallest cell or down to the smallest atom or, or elementary particle, with a difference that there's, they don't have consciousness. There's, there's no inner light. They don't feel anything. And uh, the, the truth of the matter is that we haven't yet figured out why we are not zombies. And I know, I think I know that I'm not a zombie, but, but uh, for, for, for the rest of, of entities, you guys, and, and uh, I mean, I know dogs who seem uh, conscious, but, but, but that's, I think, a bit more of an open question and you can go down the scale to, to, to smaller and more primitive animals and, and, and people become increasingly unsure of, uh, on whether they're conscious. And, and uh, I think that this kind of question applies uh, to machines as well. I don't know anybody who believes that their toaster is, is conscious, uh, uh, but, but uh, as machines uh, become uh, increasingly capable on, on, in, uh, in uh, cognitive domains, we're probably going to start feeling increasingly uncertain about whether they are uh, conscious or not. And uh, maybe there's a, just to connect with what you said about the possibility of, of uh, consciousnesses that are very, very different from our human ones. Uh, it seems like when it comes to animals, uh, the, our tendency to ascribe consciousness to animals correlates very strongly with whether or not they have human looking faces. And it's kind of a silly idea that, that consciousness would reside in the face. It probably does not. Uh, so, uh, we shouldn't trust ourselves when we declare something as to be non-conscious just because it looks non-human. I'm, I'm, I'm very, very uh, epistemically humble about this issue. I think it's fundamentally unsolved. Uh, it also makes me think that if uh, consciousness resided in the face, there, there might be less of a Botox industry. Not sure <laughs> that one. Yeah. Um, you do a few times also in the book talk about um, a little bit as you do uh, you did in your in your last response that that we don't really have a, a future that's written in stone when it comes to AI. There there are a lot of things still very much in flux. Um, but what are some of the things you would like to see enacted to give us the best possible footing with AI, given that? we don't really fully know the, the, the directions that it will take uh, at this moment. We, we can't forecast it fully yet. Right. Um, so sh should I talk uh, uh, here about the down to earth issues or, or should we uh, stick to the high flying? I'm gonna AGM? leave that as your call. You can no, do a little no, of both. You can stick no, to one, no. whichever the mood strikes you. I, I trust your consciousness to no. pick whichever <laughs> you feel comfortable. I mean, the, the, there are plenty of concrete stuff we can do on the down to earth issues, uh, regulating uh, the way that the uh, IT companies uh, um, do, uh, use AI uh, to manipulate the consumers. Uh, we can try and put regulations into place to, to prevent the autonomous weapons arms race and, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of stuff. It's a lot harder to, uh, uh, to say what concretely should be done to make sure that an AGI breakthrough uh, turns out well. Uh, but but uh, if I'm allowed to talk a little more, bit more abstractly about it, uh, I think that there is a tendency uh, to, towards a race mentality in AI development that is dangerous. Because if you have two or more nations or two or more companies that are competing for
for um, first reaching uh, the, uh, this great breakthrough. And this could be the, what, what I call the, I talk about it in, in the subtitle of the book, An Artificial Intelligence in the Yellow Book. That's, it, it, that's the AI breakthrough. But it could, I mean, the same thing happens on smaller scales when they're just competing for, for first grabbing a particular market uh, segment. Because what happens when this race mentality sets in is that there's less time for each player to think carefully about social consequences and ethical issues and making the AI safe. Safety is a big issue here. And instead, if, if, if you feel this rush uh, from, from your competitors, you want to do everything you can to make your, your AI as capable as possible, as fast as possible, ignoring those uh, other issues. So is, if, if there are ways to um, move away from this race mentality and introduce a greater sense of collaboration and cooperation uh, uh, around our joint future, I, I think that uh, that would be a, a good thing. And we have some such structures uh, on the, uh, on the climate issue, for instance, they are very, very far uh, from perfect, but we could try and, and set up through the United Nations uh, or, or, or by other means, uh, international uh, collaborative bodies uh, around AI uh, development. I think that's, uh, that's a key thing. And more generally, I think that uh, if we divert, if you, if you look at the resources put into uh, artificial intelligence development today, I would say that the vast majority of this is, is for maximizing AI capability in various domains. And if we divert some of those resources towards making AI socially beneficial uh, and safe, I think, uh, that's uh, that would be an improvement. We just had a, a kind of question uh, in the chat yeah. that's sort of a follow up. I'll I'll read it out, and then yeah. if I if I haven't done it justice, our, our questioner can perhaps uh, chime in. But the question is uh, on the topic of uh, manipulation, picked up in the draft EU AI legislation. Is it not a red herring to regulate AI and not? the act of manipulation. So in other words, if the fear is of manipulation, why not address that? Because AI is just one technology uh, that one can manipulate. So I'll, I'll pause here and see if our questioner, Hema, has ha wanted to add to that or, uh, or uh, give you any more to go on there with the question, or if not, we can have you answer it. Um. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to take the opportunity of having this excellent thinker here in the seminar um, and would want you, if you could, to reflect on this focus on AI rather than the use of AI. Yeah. Um, it seems to be there where the real fear is. Um, it seems to be a trend of focusing on the technology, which in a way yeah. should be neutral rather than actually what we use it for. Yes. Uh... I sometimes hear this argument. I'm a little bit suspicious of it. Uh, and uh, I think it's most clear in the case uh, of uh, AI technology for uh, military autonomous weapons. Uh, I would hear uh, a colleague say that, well, uh, it's, it's not... Uh, uh, my call as, as an AI researcher uh, to, to think about whether we should develop this technology or not. Uh, because, as you say, there are no inherently e e evil or, or good technologies. It depends on the uses. And I think that, well, it sounds very much like the, the old, I think, um, the gun lobby in the United States like to say that guns don't kill people, people kill people. But the fact is that if you put guns in the hands of a lot of people, you create a dangerous 
situation and cannot hide behind the uh, uh, saying that uh, it's it's up to these people to 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 do what they will. And with if, if we let loose uh, an uh, autonomous weapons uh, arms race, this is going to be very difficult to to. Uh, uh, prevent from uh, spreading to uh, rogue nations and, and terrorist organizations and so on. So by, by developing these technologies, uh, we create a situation where, where um, there is a risk that terrorists get access to technologies that can the rest of society can have difficulties uh, fully uh, defending against. And I think that engineers and, and, and scientists have, just like every other human being, have a responsibility for the consequences uh, of what they're doing. So, so but that's really, that's really my answer to that question. Um, Thank you. And I fully agree with your last comment that everybody got the responsibility. Um, no. And that is really what I wanted to capture, because, uh, again, it goes from those who start with the fundamental researcher mm -hmm. to those who actually uh, the, um, produce the final product. Mm -hmm. And, okay. and uh, I would, I mean, I don't want to be too one-sided here. Of course, I agree that there's a complication that technologies are, are, are too... Uh, dual use uh, in this respect that they can be used uh, for good or for bad but we still have to have to uh, act responsibly as uh, as developers thank you thank you so i'll jump back in here uh, although if others do have questions go ahead and put them in the chat and i can make sure we we get to them but um a lot of the book is a little bit uh I won't say actively frightening, although maybe I will say actively frightening. So are you uh, are you kind of uh, taking this book and, and having uh, one point of it to be to let us know we're all going to die in an AI apocalypse or, or, or this should be something to strike terror into us? Or uh, is that my own uh, very human individuality getting the best of me here? You are not the first one to suggest that I, I, I would be a doomsayer. Uh, but I don't want to, to, to think of myself as one. What a, the message here is that if we don't take care, there's a risk that things go badly. So we should uh, proceed with foresight and uh, caution and make sure uh, that we don't uh, end up in a bad situation. And, and uh, I'm, I'm convinced uh, that... Uh, if we try, uh, we, we have a good chance of, of getting a really, really good outcome from AI, ripening the benefits from, I mean, we've already seen over, over humanity's uh, history so far that we can gain enormous benefits from intelligence. And when we create even greater intelligence, I, I think that there's the potential for even greater benefits. But we need to take care. It almost sounds like part of what you're saying is this isn't so much a technological problem as a problem with us pesky humans. We, we have to sort of uh, uh, take the right paths, irrespective of what technologies actually aid us to get those uh, technologies to not be the yeah. terror striking uh, agents that I was suggesting they are. Is this more a, a problem with humans than with the, with the technology? Uh, development itself? I think it's both. I mean, we've always had problems with humans uh, doing the wrong things and, and uh, creating uh, bad situations. But with increasingly uh, powerful technologies, the stakes are raised. Um, and also, I mean, uh, even if, if we humans agree that uh, we want uh, AGI to have all these beneficial uh, consequences and to avoid uh, the paperclip apocalypse or terminator scenarios or, or, or whatever. 
even if we agree on that, it's not a trivial task uh, to implement this uh, when you create uh, advanced AI. For instance, everybody who has done a little bit of programming knows that as soon as there is a discrepancy between what you intend the machine to do and what you actually uh, code the machine to do, if you make errors in your coding and there could be subtle um, uh, subtle errors in, in, your, in how you set up the algorithms and so on, things, things can go wrong. So, so it's, it, the problem has a large uh, technical element uh, together with this uh, social, scientific, human element. So it's, it's very complex and we need uh, thinkers from all sorts of disciplines uh, to, to uh, collaborate uh, on these issues. We've had another good question come up in the chat, so I'm going to give voice to this, and then uh, as I did with uh, Hema, I'll, I'll give Joshua a chance to follow up as well. But the the question is uh, following up from Hema's question. Many of the most controlling AIs that we interact with, and examples here are Facebook and Google Search and Twitter. Uh, these things were created for different aims. Unintended consequences are real, but also make it difficult to know where the onus of responsibility lies. So uh, should we look at the responsibility being with the inventor, the regulators, the users, the shareholders? Uh, and Joshua, uh, if you wanted to add anything to that before we get our answer, please feel free to do so. Yeah, no, it, it just made me think that um, in, that, in that process of evolution of, for example, AIs, and Facebook's a good example, I mean, it, it didn't have the intention to, for example, support something like ISIS when it was created, but like it ended up being used that way. So there are other actors that can take an AI that's been invented for a particular reason, maybe a very good reason, like connecting people, which is what Facebook said, right? Maybe that wasn't the initial intention, but I mean, so, but that, so how do we, how do we think about those layers of responsibility? If we're thinking about AI ethics in terms of responsibility, how do we think about where to, where to insert the responsibility in that long chain? And, and also what's the time horizon? Because those AIs can develop over a long period of time, the property rights can be bought up by different companies and so on. So how, how, do, we, how, do, we, how do you think about that? Yeah. Uh... I think it's a very, very good question. Not surprisingly, I don't have a complete uh, answer to it. I think that these questions of responsibility are very difficult. W one thing about unintended consequences, for instance, in, in, in uh, dual use technologies, I don't think that the developers can get off the hook by saying that we only intended this to have good consequences. Uh, I think that uh, as a developer, uh, one is obliged to think through uh, as best as one can all the various kinds of consequences that the technology can have, the intended ones, but also the one that you were not uh, aiming for. Uh, I mean, there are loads of, 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 of uh, other questions of, about uh, responsibility that are, I mean, on a slightly less frightening level, but 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 for instance, with um, with uh, AI tools uh, for medical diagnostics, uh, we tend to feel that that as these tools get better, uh, the crucial decisions about how to treat uh, the patient should still be uh, with the, do the human doctor. Or, or in some cases, of course, in, in, uh, in consultation uh, with the patient, but the, that these crucial decisions should not be taken by the machines. But uh, as these machines get better and the doctors learn that uh, in, in the long run, uh, every time that they deviate from the recommendations of this AI system, they just risk uh, messing things up. So, 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 so at some point they realize that the best thing is always to do as the machine suggests, even when they don't understand the details behind 
these recommendations. And if, if in such a situation we keep insisting that, that the, 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 the human should decide, we're turning uh, the human into a, a symbolic, uh, how do you say, gallions figure in English? Would it be figurehead? Uh, yeah, I think so. It, at, at the front of the ship. Yeah, figurehead. Yeah. yeah. Yes, at, we don't want to turn uh, humans into uh, powerless uh, figureheads uh, carrying the uh, formal responsibility while not understanding at all uh, what is going on. So I think the whole AI field uh, creates uh, all sorts of, of, of uh, responsibility distribution uh, dilemmas uh, of this kind. And I don't pretend to have the answers except to say that we should put real serious effort into thinking about these concerns. Joshua, is that good enough? Can, can I just follow up really quickly? Uh, I was just thinking that, uh, I mean, one of the responses that I'm sure you're going to get from somebody working in industry is going to say something like the extra amount of time it takes to work through these kind of questions will make any kind of creative or profitable creation of AI impossible. So, so how, how do you balance the, the industry that would say something like that, that, well, I mean, if we have to try to think through all of the potential um, consequences of developing this AI, we, we won't ever get to the point of developing it. So, so for one thing, I mean, uh, thinking literally about every oh, of course. consequence, that's, that's, that's taking it too far, but, but, yeah. but doing this in a, to, to a reasonable extent, I think that trying to get away from that responsibility is tantamount to saying that we are, uh, we insist on developing this potentially uh, dangerous technology, but we are not taking on the responsibility of, of thinking through the safety issues and so on. I think that's just unacceptable. Uh, Maybe you need to do this to make money, but, but uh, if, if, if that's the case, then you should try and find some less dangerous uh, domain to make money in. Sell some food. <laughs> uh, uh, but then if they don't like regulation, maybe we're eating tainted food. I, I, I take back my suggestion. Um, if you had an ideal reader for this book, they've just read it, they've closed the book, what would you want them to think or believe and or do after having read your book? Can I choose the demographics and whatever of this <laughs> ideal reader? Uh, we're in the realm of the ideal, so go yeah, ahead. Yeah, I want, want her to be uh, 18 or 19 years old and uh, uh, on the verge of choosing uh, where to direct uh, her uh, career uh, and uh, exactly uh, what to do depends uh, on the individual, whether to enter the uh, AI industry and uh, uh, through uh, engineering feasts pull, pull it in, in the right direction or to work for a uh, safer and, and uh, happy and, and flourishing future in, in other domains. This will depend on, on the uh, individual dispositions uh, and talents and so on. But, but uh, if it would turn out that I have some of these uh, young readers whom I can influence uh, to uh, devote their lives to something that is just not just about making a living for themselves, uh, but uh, for making uh, the world better. And of course, this is a much broader thing uh, than, than just, uh, uh, just a question about artificial intelligence. That would be wonderful. And in fact, I have an afterword in the book where I say some of this, and I even suggest that if you, young reader, uh, take this seriously, you can actually turn to the 80,000 hours organization and they offer 
uh, free uh, consulting uh, for young people who think about how to best spend a career to make uh, the world better. I appreciated that you you had that uh, optimistic note at the end. It made me feel less less frightening. But to get back to some some comments here, I'll do as I've done with the others. I'll read out the comment and then commenter, please feel free to uh, add. But the comment from Richard says, "What perspective does your book add to the field? Was there uh, any perspective that was currently missing? I.e., did you have a specific rationale or goal behind writing the book?" And Richard, if there's anything you want to add, we can pause here for you. Otherwise, we can take the answer. I don't think that there is anything that is truly uh, original uh, in the book. Uh, it's just that uh, I put together uh, uh, various uh, parts of the discussion around different sorts of, of artificial intelligence uh, that uh, hadn't previously uh, been uh, synthesized uh, in, in quite the same way. You could compare my book to uh, the 2019 uh, book by uh, computer scientist Stuart Russell in Berkeley, uh, Human Compatible, which I think is a wonderful book. And, and uh, I'm not saying that my book is, is, is better than, than his. It's, uh, maybe it captures a little bit more about the very most recent uh, developments, just in virtue of being two years uh, more recent. But uh, one issue that Russell ignores uh, and that also Nick Bostrom ignores in his book and so on is consciousness. I have a chapter on consciousness uh, where, where I do insist. Russell has a passage where he basically says the machines uh, will do what they do and given uh, that they do what they do, it doesn't really matter to us whether they are conscious or not. And, and, and there's some force in that argument, but I think that there are other reasons uh, why we should still think uh, as hard as we can about consciousness as well. One aspect here is that uh, the question of whether we at some point can have moral responsibility towards the machines depends largely on whether machines uh, can suffer or feel happy or so on, which presupposes uh, consciousness. If, they, if they're not conscious, then there's not so much reason to, to act morally uh, towards them. So that's an example of, of, of one aspect that was missing in, in a couple of the previous um, most important uh, books on the topic. But the, even these aspects have, have appeared elsewhere. So. Nothing new, it's just, just that uh, the collection of, of topics and subtopics is, uh, I think, more unique than any of the particular constituents. And I could say from the reader's perspective, I, I know I really appreciated that there was that mix of what you call the grounded and the high flying and, and the consciousness mm -hmm. topic made me go back to uh, the Ian McEwan book, ah. uh, Machines Like Us, uh, mm -hmm. because I, I that question of consciousness is something that, uh, like you say, it's nothing we, we are going to have to face uh, later this afternoon, but it, it's something that, that certainly bears out uh, thinking about. Um, but we have another question that I'm going to hop to because I know we're running low on time. And this is uh, Hema. There was a WAF uh, risk report 2021 uh, picked for the first time up. The risk of the digital divide in their top five risks. And uh, EU legislation aims to protect EU citizens. And AI is enabling rich countries to bring low skill labor home, the, the results of low skill labor home. So Emma's question is, how do we ensure that poorer countries don't become real victims here of AI and technology development? And Emma, I don't know if you needed to uh, add something to that. Um, no, no, that's very well put. Uh, it's more about because all technologies will want to have test beds. Um, yes. And it's, of course, there is always a risk that test beds will be in those countries where the institutions are very weak. 
So uh, I understand it's not part of the book, but I also no. want to take the opportunity to hear your views on this to take forward for this group. I think uh, global economic justice and, and, and other notions of justice is a, a very important part uh, of the discussion. And uh, if we think about scenarios uh, where we can uh, decrease the amount of uh, human labor uh, and, and uh, make uh, machines uh, do the work for us, there's a real risk in the possibility that uh, the uh, machine work will be carried out in, in, in just a, f a few countries that will become very, very rich. And uh, when we think about, uh, I mean, we've been talking uh, since the 60s or 70s, at least a lot about uh, global economic justice. And, uh, and we tend to think about uh, Europe as the um, one of the most flourishing parts of the world and, and uh, poverty uh, belongs to more southerly regions. And even that is not something that, that we can uh, uh, take for granted. Uh, it could, could be that if we don't uh, coordinate uh, uh, globally in the right way, that more and more power will be uh, concentrated to, to Silicon Valley and uh, similar regions, maybe in, in, in China or a few other countries. But, but uh, and, and I, I talk a lot about in the section about um, uh, economic response to automation. I talk about um, uh, what's it called? Uh, universal basic income. And I think that for universal basic income to be truly effective to uh, alleviate um, these uh, economic uh, injustices on the global scale, it has to be implemented uh, on a global scale. Uh, what good is it for, for a, a poor country that has been left uh, behind to, uh, uh, to have universal basic income within that country? That, that wouldn't be truly universal. If, if all the income from, from uh, uh, production uh, goes to other countries. There is a concrete suggestion that was put forth uh, last year uh, in a report from, from a group of researchers in England called the Windfall Clause, uh, suggesting that the big tech companies sign uh, something they call the Windfall Clause, uh, which, is, uh, which would commit them to, in case one of these uh, companies hits gold in the uh, attempt to find uh, better and better AI, uh, uh, hit gold to an extent that uh, the company's uh, production and worth would constitute uh, a substantial fraction of the entire world's GDP, the company hitting maybe 5% or 10% or something. Which is, I mean, we haven't seen anything uh, in that regime so far, but, but it could happen. But, but uh, the clause would commit the company to spend a substantial fraction of their income uh, in a way that uh, ensures that the entire world population uh, benefits uh, from these uh, developments. And I suggest plenty of reasons why, why this suggestion is not as unrealistic as it might sound uh, from, from this perspective. Uh, it can be seen as a kind of an insurance policy and also a, a way to achieve uh, better public uh, relations towards the general public, towards governments, towards the, uh, their own employees and so on. So maybe the most likely outcome is not that this particular idea is, is going to be implemented, but the important thing here is that there are ideas out there on how to handle uh, extreme and rapid technological development in ways that helps ensure 
that the entire world population gets part of the benefits. And as much, I, as sorry, I did cut you off there. I was just gonna say as much as I'd like to keep asking you questions, it looks like we're kind of uh, running pretty low on time. So one of the things I can say that uh, if there was an AI topic you were thinking of that we didn't talk about, it's likely to show up in this book. We have everything from uh, cat videos, troll farms, uh, cognitive self-improvement in a recursive way in here. So if there was something you were hoping that would be discussed and we didn't get to it, I, I can't promise you, but I'm fairly certain you're going to find something uh, to entertain, enlighten you in this book. So uh, thank you for letting me be a part of this. But before I do anything else, were there any other questions? I think we could probably try and squeeze in one quick, quick one. You've stunned them into silence. But thank you. Thank I you, really Kathy. enjoyed it. Thank um, you. Thank you, everybody who coped with us and, 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 and stayed here listening and yeah uh, it was uh, it was a great uh, enjoyment to to uh, talk to you about this book and a fun book to read okay <laughs>